This is episode number 32 with Neil Donald Walsh. The Melissa Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, mindsets, tools, and rituals that they have used to become world class so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? Neil Donald Walsh is a modern-day spiritual messenger whose words continue to touch the world in profound ways. With an early interest in religion and a deeply felt connection to spirituality, Neil spent the majority of his life thriving professionally, yet searching for spiritual meaning before experiencing his now-famous Conversations with God. The Conversations with God series of books that emerged from those encounters have been translated into 37 languages, touching millions and inspiring important changes in their day-to-day lives. He has written 29 books on spirituality and its practical application in everyday life, and seven of those books have reached the New York Times bestseller list with Conversations of God Book 1 occupying that list for over two and a half years. How cool is that? Now, this book has changed my life. I know, big call, but it did. It was a huge turning point for me in my journey and same for my husband, actually, which you will find out more about in today's episode. Now, we both love this book so much that on our wedding day, we actually had two of our best friends read passages from the book because it was just so beautiful and potent. The reminders are powerful, they're simple, and are articulated in such an easy to digest and simple way, which is one of the reasons why I love this book so much. In today's episode, we chat about Neil's journey and how he got to where he is today, how the conversations with God phenomenon came about, the passage in the book that brought my husband and I together, how to deal with challenges when they pop up today, the tool that will change your life, how he deals with stuff when it comes up today, and let it be said that it does, he isn't enlightened and doesn't walk on water yet. Are you really creating your own reality? We discuss this topic, why being self-centered is key, why expectations ruin relationships, how and why sex is sacred and an extraordinary expression of love, plus so much more. For everything that we mention in today's episode, you can check out in the show notes and that is at melissarambrosini.com forward slash 32. I am so excited for you guys to hear this episode with the one and only Neil Donald Walsh. Neil, I am so grateful and so honored to have you on the show today. I'm just bursting with excitement. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. How may I serve you? Well, the first thing that I ask everyone on my show is, what did they have for breakfast this morning? So I would love to know what you had for brekkie this morning. I don't eat breakfast. Okay, great. So it's not every day that I get to speak to an amazing messenger like yourself who has impacted as many people as you have. And I only interview people who have personally impacted and inspired me. And I have to say, very few people have impacted me as much as you have and your work has, and in particular, your book, Conversations with God. It was life-changing for me, and I remember highlighting almost the entire book, and I've spoken to many people who have done the same and had post-it notes put throughout the whole book. I can't imagine what it's been like for you, but 
for those who aren't familiar with your books and your work, can you take us back to before conversations with God and the whole phenomenon and, you know, that moment where maybe everything changed for you? Was there a specific moment? Yes. First of all, just to provide a little backstory, um, there was a time in my life, now around 25 years ago or so, when everything began falling apart, and it all began falling apart at the same time. Um, my career had reached a complete dead end. My um, health was going rapidly downhill, and even my relationship uh, was falling apart. All these things happening simultaneously in the same moment of my life. And so I was so angry uh, with life and, and with God, because I had a belief that there was this thing called God, and uh, but I didn't know what my interaction with it might be or could be or should be, but I just always thought there was some kind of higher power in the universe. So I wound up becoming very angry with life itself, if you please, and with God. And, and one night at 4.30 in the morning, I just threw back the covers because I couldn't sleep anymore, and I found myself wandering around the house. I, I sat down on the couch, and I began writing a very angry letter to God. What does it take to make life work? I don't understand. I don't get it. What have I done to deserve a life of such continuing struggle? Somebody tell me the rules. I'll play. I swear I'll play the game. Just give me the rule book, please. And don't change them once you give me the rules. Because my experience had been that the rules of life were changing. It seemed like day to day. So I just wrote, you know, this angry letter to no one in particular. I mean, I, you know, just, just to get it out of my system. But then at, at that point, I did hear a voice over my right shoulder. And it was a, a, a physical voice in the room. It wasn't an imagination. I heard it in the room. Very gentle, soft voice that simply said, Neil, do you really want answers to all of these questions? Or are you just venting? Well, of course, I turned around. There's nobody there. It's 4.30 in the morning. I'm thinking to myself, oh, great. Now, not only am I you know, going through this period of time in my life where nothing is working, but now I'm going out of my mind at the same time. I'm losing my senses. There's nobody in the room. Where did that voice come from? But I kind of laughed at myself, and I remember thinking, well, <laughs> I may be venting, but if you've got answers, I'd sure like to know what they are. And with that, my mind was filled with answers to those questions. And there were answers that I never dreamt of before, nothing I'd ever read any place, nothing that had ever been taught to me by my you know, school or my religion or my background or my culture or my family, just you know, stuff that I never imagined. So I began writing these thoughts that were coming to me, writing them down. Uh, the voice now, if I could put it this way, had moved inside of my head, was presenting itself really as the voice of my own thoughts, the sound of one's own thoughts, what I call a voiceless voice. But I began writing very rapidly what I imagined myself to be hearing in my mind. And as I began writing uh, what I was hearing, other questions came up, as you could imagine. I, would, I found myself saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about this, what about that? That can't be true, what about this, how does that work? And I began asking questions uh, in the middle of receiving this information. I was given answers. As soon as I asked a question, the answer would come to me immediately. I would write down that answer, which would sponsor another question. And I would write down that answer, which would sponsor another question. And before I knew it, Melissa, I was involved in an on-paper dialogue. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. This went on for three hours. It was now 7.30 in the morning. And I had to start getting myself ready to go off to work. Uh, but I realized that I had had this extraordinary encounter, and my whole experience of it changed uh, my life. I was filled with uh, uh, joy. I hate to be so predictable, but I was actually filled with a level of happiness that actually caused tears uh, to come to my eyes, the kind of tears that one experiences when, when one is so happy, you almost weep for joy. And that's what my experience was. I never felt so peaceful. I never felt so serene. I never felt so put together in my life. And all of my complaints seemed to just wash away. 
So I let it go at that. I got up, you know, and I had to go on with my day. But the next morning at 4.23 in the morning, I was awakened, startled awake almost. Oh, yeah, I got I to gotta finish that. I got to finish that, that dialogue I was having. So I went back out to the coffee table. There was the yellow legal pad just where I had left it. I picked up the conversation, if you please, began asking other questions. This went on for three and a half or four weeks until I had hundreds of pages of handwritten notes back and forth. And that's uh, what, when you asked me, was there a moment when my life changed? Yes, it was, I think it was January uh, 8th, 1980, if I remember correctly, but don't, don't quote me on the date, but it was about 25 or 30 years ago, and, and uh, my whole life changed there. Now, before you ask, I'll tell you, how did it ever become a book? Because, you know, I continued this on-paper dialogue, as I mentioned, for three or four weeks. I thought I was having a personal moment of, you know, journaling, what one, one might call it a diary or journaling. I was just having a private, you know, uh, process, if you will. It was being very helpful to me, and I was enjoying it, but I never dreamt that anybody in the world would ever see any of this. But at one point, the dialogue said to me, this will one day become a book. And I thought to myself, oh, wow, now, now I've got you. Now I got you. Because that can be measured. That was a measurable outcome. Everything else that I was hearing, if I could put it that way, everything else that I was receiving was, you know, conceptual, theoretical in nature. Could be, could not be. But but here was a statement, a flat-out statement, that had to be true or false. This will one day become a book. And I realized, of course, there wasn't a chance in the world that any publisher in the, in the world was going to take a manuscript from an unpublished, unheard-of author and, and put it out there in the world, saying, hey, this guy's talking to God. We have to get this thing out right away. I knew, of course, that was ridiculous to even think of such a thing. So I thought... I'm going to put this to the test. And I had my handwritten notes uh, typed up by a stenographer. And when I had uh, enough pages of notes typed up, I sent them off to a couple of publishers. I think it was four or five publishers. Not 20 or 30, just to see what would happen. I sent it, I think, to four or five publishers. And one of the publishers um, rejected the book, said, said, you know, Thank you for your submission, uh, but it does not fit our titles list. But I realized that it did fit their titles list because I was only sending it to publishers who published metaphysical spiritual books. So I realized in that moment they never read the book. They just their intake editor simply, you know, he probably had too many too many unsolicited manuscripts that day, and he just ordered the secretaries send them back with a form letter. And she picked out the wrong form letter. She picked out a form letter that said, you know, that your your material does not fit our titles list. But that tipped me off that no one had ever even opened the page, opened the first page. So I called the publisher directly. I picked up the phone and I asked to speak to the owner. They put me through to the owner. And I said, you know, what what, what gives? You know, I, I wrote him a letter and I, I, I said, I'm going to send you this thing back. And I sent it back to him with a note that said, read any 10 pages. Then if you don't like it, if you don't think it's worth publishing, fair enough, but at least, you know, read eight or 10 pages. So he did. He took me up on it. He read, he read 10 pages and he called me back and he said, we want to publish this book. And the rest is, as they say, publishing history. The book went on to sell over a million copies, translated into 37 languages, and then creating an entire global phenomena, publishing phenomena. That's the long answer to your very short question. Thank you so much for sharing. That's beautiful. And I'm so grateful they read those 10 pages. That's for sure. Yeah, I am too. It, it's you know changed a lot of things for millions of people. It sure has. Me being one of them, that's for sure, and my husband. And you won't know this, but one of the reasons I'm with my husband today is because of a passage that he read in Conversations with God. Um, he was on a boat on a surf trip in Bali with a couple of his friends, and he had 
two books with him and one of them was your book, Conversations with God. And at the time he was about to propose to another woman. Then he read the following passage. Let your love propel your beloved into the world and into the full experience of who they are. In this, you will have truly loved. And when he read that passage, he instantly knew that he had to let her go. And when he got home from the trip, that's what they did. And they had a very conscious and beautiful uncoupling, you can call it. And six months later, we were together and engaged. So I just wanted to thank you for writing that beautiful passage. Well, I'm, I'm grateful that um, the God of my understanding uh, had, gave me those words and allowed me the opportunity to share them uh, with everyone whose life I was able to touch. Those words were, were sent to me, of course, uh, at, at a time when my relationship was falling apart and I was desperately trying to hold it together. And God said exactly those words to me, just let your love propel your beloved other into the world. And I did exactly the same thing that your husband did in his situation. I, I, I didn't have to go home because I was ready home, but I just called out to my wife with whom I was having a struggling, difficult time. And I said, look, sweetheart, let's talk. We've had 10 good years together. We were married 10 years. I said, but this is not working for me. And it clearly is not working for you. Why don't we just let each other go? and go on with our lives. And she, the look of relief that crossed her face, it wasn't even anger, it was just relief. Like, oh my God, he got it. Without having to yell and scream and holler and fight and or tearful crying or any rage, he just simply got it. And we were able to hold each other as, as close friends for the first time in a long time. And we let each other go. And now I'm married to my lovely, lovely, M. Claire, with whom I've now been married 10 years. We've been married 10 years in September. So, yes, I have the same story to tell that you have. Mm, so beautiful. And when I was looking over my book notes, so I made book notes after I read book one and book two. But after book one, I made this extensive list of book notes. And before I you know, got on this call with you, I've been doing a little bit of uh prep and research. And I went back over all of my book notes and re-highlighted my own book notes. And there was so many nuggets of wisdom. I just was thinking, okay, how are we going to you know, unpack just one thing? There's so many good things. But one thing that I really loved that was in the book is that you say, in every experience, there is a hidden treasure. And I absolutely agree. And I love that. But for someone who's listening, and maybe they are going through an incredibly tumultuous time right now, it sometimes can feel incredibly difficult to see the hidden treasure. So, what would you say for someone who might be experiencing a dark moment right now? Trust. Trust that the treasure is there. Trust that time will reveal that to you. Trust that there is a, a larger process going on. I like to say to my audiences, guys, there's more going on here than meets the eye. This is not just, you know, a process, you know, get the guy, get the girl, get the car, get the job, get the house, get the spouse, get the kids, get the better job, get the better car, get the better house, get the better spouse, get the better spouse, get the better spouse, get the better spouse. <laughs> You know, get the get the get the, get the, get, the, get the office in the corner with the glass windows, and you know, get your name on the door, or maybe even your name on the building, and then get the gray hair, get the sickness, get the cruise tickets, and get the hell out. But there's more going on here than that. And and so, what I say to people who are facing difficult and challenging times, first thing I say is, look, I understand, I get it. I spent a year on the street, living as a street person for one solid year of my life, get, gathering coins from people that I would ask for help on the sidewalk and eating whatever I could, trying to get through the day. So I, do, I know about difficult times. I've, I've suffered a broken neck in a car accident. I, 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 so I wound up walking around with a 
therapeutic collar on for two years and going to physical therapy first every day, then every other day, then twice a week and so forth. For two years, I understand about difficult times. I've had broken relationships and broken marriages. I understand about difficult times. So the first thing I say to people is, you're not talking to someone who's speaking to you from the mountaintop. I've, I've been there and ha had those experiences in my life. But I can tell you from my experience, this is not theory, this is not concept, I can tell you from my experience there's something much larger going on here. Your soul has come. You do have a soul. That's number one. You are not just a, 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 a biological entity. You have a soul. You are a three-part being made up of body, mind, and soul. And your soul has an agenda that's quite different from the agenda of your body and your mind. And I can assure you that everything that's occurring in your life is serving the agenda of your soul. And that agenda is the same for all of us. The evolution of who we are, the expansion and the growing of the experience of ourselves uh, as our, in our true identity. So, And everything that occurs in our life uh, occurs as a co-creation of all the souls involved designed perfectly to allow ourselves to expand and to evolve into the next grandest version of who we really are. So what I would say to people who are going through difficult time now is trust. Trust that this is part of a larger process, that you may not be able to see the gift in it for you right now. You probably won't be able to see that gift, but I promise you it's there. And, and then I would share with them an experience that I've had in my lecturing around the world. I would say to those people, let me share something with you. I've been lecturing now on this topic for about 25 years all over the world. And in front of every audience that I talk to, I ask the same question. I say to my audience, how many of you have ever had an experience in your life that you were convinced was the worst possible thing that could happen to you in that moment, only to realize six weeks or six months or a few years later that it was actually the best thing that ever happened to you. How many of you have ever had that experience? And almost every hand goes up. 95% of the hands go up. And, I, and in every audience, no matter what culture, no matter what city I'm in, all the hands go up. Everybody has had that experience. So I, say to, I would say to that person, if I was offering them individual coaching, I'd say to that person, Consider the possibility that this is exactly that in your experience and that a time will come when you will look back on this and see the gift that you cannot see today. And the fastest way to get there is to be grateful. The tool that I give them is the tool of gratitude. I invite them to move into, it's very, uh, um, how would I say it? counterintuitive. It's not the, the first emotion that comes up for us in moments like that, but it is the most beneficial emotion. So I invite people to move into gratitudes. Thank you, God, for this present circumstance and the perfection of what is being brought into my experience right here, right now. Thank you for placing before me the right and perfect situations, events, and circumstances, allowing me to demonstrate the next grandest version of the greatest vision ever I held about who I am. And thank you for helping me to understand that this problem has already been solved for me. It's simply waiting for me to step into that experience. And you know what, excuse me, but the wonder, the wonder of shifting one's energy from uh, anger and resentment or upset or even worry and anxiety uh, to, to gratitude, the wonder of shifting our energy to one of gratitude is that it cr creates an energetic signature. That is, it affects the energy that, that projects from us into the situation or circumstance or even the other person or people who are involved in it. We begin to project energy outward, and if the energy that we project outward is one of gratitude rather than one of resistance, see, conversations with God made it very clear to me, Neil, what you resist persists. And what you look at with gratitude ceases to have its illusory form. That is a powerful metaphysical truth, 
and a powerful metaphysical tool. So when we embrace gratitude, it doesn't just shift our inner emotional holding of the experience, it radically alters the energetics of the moment. It changes the energy that we project outward from us onto the experience, and that has an effect that can often transform the experience itself and make it go away. I love what you said before about not shouting from the mountaintops, and you have shared some of the things that you personally have been through living on the streets and the broken neck and you know everything that you've gone through, and I'm sure there's so many other things as well. But how do you deal today if something does come up for you? Is it as simple as just you know, a little light switch or, and you remember, or do you have moments today where you forget? No, I'm a perfect person. Uh, <laughs> I, I walk on water most days of my life. Uh, and, and I, um, I am perfection personified. I never have moments. Of course I have moments. Like <laughs> Yay. Okay, good. Not yay, but you know, so many people can put you on a pedestal and and other people as well. And it's so beautiful to hear. So um, can you tell us about how you move through those on a daily basis today if it comes up? Well, I, I give myself, first of all, permission to have that experience. In other words, I don't make myself wrong. I don't get into, Neil, you should know better. Well, read your own books. How dare you go out and teach this and you can't even practice it? You know, but I've got, there's a great temptation to do that, of course, because I think I've got to be better than everybody else. But uh, the first, so the first thing I do is have compassion. Very, very important that I have compassion for myself and say, you know what? It's okay. No one said you were a walking master and you're not. You're moving toward mastery. You're seeking to shift your experience of yourself. Fair enough. But no one, this is not a test. No one says you have to get there by a certain day and a certain time. So I have compassion for myself. It's okay to feel the way you're feeling. And that's the first thing that I tell people when I give them spiritual coaching as well, which I do in my spiritual mentoring program, because I talk to people all the time who are facing these same kinds of moments in their lives. And I say to them, look, f f f at number one, let yourself have the emotion that you're having. If you're angry, be angry. If you're sad, be sad. If you're scared, be scared. If you're upset, be upset. If you're disappointed and frustrated, then be disappointed and frustrated. Don't try to not have those emotions because you think you should somehow rise above them and be better than that. See, the only way out is the way through. The only way out is the way through. Now, you don't have to stay in there and dwell in there for you a whole weekend or a whole month or a whole year or whatever time you think that you need to get through it. You can get through it literally in a few moments. But what you resist persists. What you pick up and hold in your hand, you can then set aside. But if you just look at it from across the room, you can't set it aside. It's going to stay there as long as you're staring at it. So what you resist persists. Pick it up, embrace it, hold it. Allow yourself to experience it fully and completely. And then, once you've had the experience, whether it takes five minutes or ten minutes or a half hour or whatever, to move through that, then allow yourself to shift into gratitude for the experience itself about which you have become frustrated or upset or worried or angry. Just to say, you know, my, my favorite phrase, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for helping me to understand that this problem has already been solved for me. And thank you for presenting this one more opportunity for me to announce and declare, express and fulfill, become and experience who I really am. And then I thank all the people who are involved in the co-creation and all of my anger, if there is any anger built up, all of my resentment, if there is any resentment residing there, tends to melt away. And I, and I realize, oh, wow, you know what? This stuff works. I'll be darned. This stuff works. I should write a book. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I already wrote 33. <laughs> oh, gosh. Thank you so much. That's, you know, I love that you said compassion. And 
it's beautiful because we can get so hard on ourselves and think we should be somewhere else, but you're so right. Just having, allowing yourself to have the experience and have compassion and look at it, you know, it's, that's when it, that's when you get the treasure and that's when you can move through it. Yes, what you resist persists, and what you look at disappears. That is, it ceases to have its illusory form. We see it for what it really is. Not opposition, but opportunity. So I always say to people, don't oppose, compose. That is, don't oppose, compose yourself. Recreate yourself anew. So I try not to oppose anything, but rather to compose myself and to create a new composition of the experience and the event that I'm facing in life. Another thing I love in the book, you say you are a big creation machine and you are turning out a new manifestation literally as fast as you can think. And I just love that. And sometimes that can be quite confronting if what people are creating or manifesting is not as pretty as they would like. So how can we create with the highest, our highest intention being to create from a place of love? Well, by doing so. I mean, there's no formula. I mean, by simply saying to ourselves, what would love do now? It's my favorite question. What, mm-hmm. what would love do now? And then, and then by simply moving toward that. I think it's important for us to understand um, about this business of creating our own reality, however. Because I asked God about that. I, we really had a deep discussion about that. What do you mean you're creating your own reality? How far, at, how far does that extend? I mean, am I creating my brother-in-law falling down the stairs and breaking his ankle last week? Am I creating uh, my, my, mother's, you know, uh, my mother's second cousin on, on her mother's side? Who had a car accident, and you know how far, how far beyond the end of my fingertips does my creative power extend? Beyond my nation, beyond my beyond my you know culture, beyond my religion. Am I responsible for the war in Iraq? At, you know, at what level does my responsibility end? How far outside of my inner circle? God said, actually, nowhere. That you are part of a co creative conglomerate, if I could put it that way, a collective, if you please, and that everything is being co-created by all of the souls involved. So you cannot take personal responsibility for the war in Iraq. You can't take personal responsibility for the terrible tsunami that hit Indonesia a few years ago, or for the world's economic conditions, or for the world's social unrest, or for that matter, for your brother-in-law's broken ankle last week when he fell, tripped and fell down the stairs. So you know, so where does your responsibility end? At the end of your nose? Only involving you? What about your spouse? What about your children? What about your family? You know, if your spouse comes home and says, I, you know, I just lost my job. Did you, did you create that? At, so very interesting metaphysical question. And what, what God said to me was, I want you to relax. I want you to understand that everything is being co-created by the lot of you, by all of you, that creation is a collaborative experience. And I said, well, then, then, then why does everyone say you're creating your own reality? And God said, okay, here comes the juice. Here comes the secret. You are creating your own reality inwardly. That is your innermost response to the outermost circumstance is what is your reality. And that is where you are creating your own reality. Hence, two people can experience the same outward event or circumstance and have two entirely different realities with regard to it. And the example that she gave me was really a kind of a, a interesting. I thought it was fascinating. She said, look, let's, let's, let's use just a, an objective experience. Rain on Saturday. Okay? It rained on Saturday. Now, the uh, farmer 
who uh, lives about five miles outside of town, is on his knees. Oh, my God, thank you, thank you for the rain. We've had a terrible six months, almost almost a drought. My, my crops were dying on the vine. I, my whole year's work is, uh, thank you, thank you for the rain. He's so grateful that for the downpour that continues throughout the day. And he considers it a blessing from God. He experienced it. His reality was, what a miracle. I prayed for rain, and I got it. Meanwhile, five miles in town, in the center of town, the parade organizer, who has spent the last six months organizing the parade, which was to take place on that day, a holiday in his community, he spent months getting the marching bands, the girls with the batons, the cars with the dignitaries, you know, the, the, the floats. The, and it started raining that morning at 7 a.m. and rain drenched. It never stopped at any point throughout the day. He was raising his fist to heaven. Are you kidding me? It hasn't rained for five months. Are you kidding me? This is the one day it would rain? You couldn't have waited till tomorrow? What, what do you call that? He's furious. He's upset. And his reality is not a happy one. Now, the external experience is quite objective. It's simply called rain on Saturday. So where we create our own reality is internally, we are in fact creating our own reality. But that doesn't mean we're creating the outer events and circumstances that produce our ability to create our reality. Those events and circumstances are being co-created collaboratively by the lot of us. And there you have a metaphysical explanation of what is meant by you're creating your own reality. Mm. Oh, gosh, that is a perfect example. Thank you so much. It's really hit home for me as well, um, because I had pondered that question too. So thank you for shining some light on that. You're very welcome. I've asked the question. It was a very important question for me to understand, because I've been asked about that by virtually every audience I've spoken to in the past 20 years. Mm. One of another thing that I absolutely love that you say is the most loving person is the person who is self with a capital S centered. Can you please explain to me what that means? Well, it means exactly what it says. Not to be abrupt, but it means exactly what it says. If you're not centered in yourself, in your holy, sacred self, then you're going to be scattered all over the place trying to please someone else or try to please yourself by using other people as tools and manipulative devices with which to do so. But if you're really self-centered, that is, that is, if you are contained within yourself and self-aware, that is, if you know who you are and what you need and what you don't need, what you choose and what you don't choose, what you wish and what you don't wish, what you love and what you hopefully don't have anything that you don't love, but what you, how you're responding to life. If you're centered within yourself, if you serve your own best interests all the time, you will become the most loving, caring, generous, compassionate, understanding, patient person on the planet. But you have to redefine what your own highest best interests are. So I advise people to be very selfish. Go through life being very selfish. I want you to serve yourself. I want you to serve your own best interests all the time. But, but I want you to get clear on how you define your best interests. And you can't be clear on what your best interests truly are until you get clear on who you truly are and why you're here. That is, what are you trying to do? See, most people I observe, myself included, did not know and still do not know many what they're doing here. People don't know what they're doing. What are you doing? I don't even know what I'm doing. I just, I didn't ask to come here. Here I am. Hey, look, give me a break. I'm trying to make the best of it. But most people have no idea who they are, where they are, why they are where they are, much less what they have the opportunity to do about that. When they get clear on the answers to those four simple questions, what I call the four fundamental questions of life, when they get clear on their answers to those questions, then they can be self-centered and they can be entirely self-serving because it serves their own best interests 
to be in the room for everyone else in their life. And there's the divine dichotomy. The divine dichotomy is that when we are totally self-centered, we are totally other-oriented. I like to say to people, I want you to say this in your mind, whenever you come into any room, any time, any place, anywhere, I want you to say it quietly, don't say it out loud, of course, but say it quietly in your mind. Whenever you enter any room, the bedroom with your spouse, the kids' playroom, the meeting room downtown with your neighbors, a public conference somewhere that you're attending, or any room at all, you know, the local grocery store, the post office lobby, whenever you enter any space at all, I want you to say this to yourself. I've come to the room to heal the room. I've come to the space to heal anything that needs to be healed. There's no other reason for me to be here. There's no other reason for me to be here. I need nothing. I have come that you may have your needs met so that I might break the illusion that you are holding that you have any needs whatsoever. Or to use the words of someone else who spoke rather eloquently on this subject, to use his words, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. And I tell people, Dare you to say those words the next time you walk into the grocery store, the next time you go into the post office, the next time you go into your bedroom, or any place at all. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. I am the source of all the joy and wonder and love that life has to offer. Here it comes from me to you. Get ready to receive, because I have just arrived. You know, you might think that's a silly thing to say, but if you do that every day of your life for six months, I promise you, your life will change so dramatically, you won't even know what hit you. You won't even know how you could have lived the way you lived the previous 30 or 35 years of your life. You say, why didn't somebody tell me this when I was 9 or 10 or 12 or 15? Why did I have to wait so many years to hear this? But of course, we, t- we were told this. We were told this by all the great spiritual masters across all the centuries and all the millennia. We simply haven't listened. Or as God said in Conversations with God, Book 1, I talk to all of you all the time. The question isn't, to whom am I speaking? The question is, who's listening? Wow, I am so excited to practice this next time I walk into a room. I have I have goosebumps all over my body. I'm going to when we finish our interview, my husband and my little boy are out in the kitchen and I'm going to say that to myself before I walk out there and I'm going to be really mindful of it. So thank you so much. That's such a great tip is such an, an easy thing to do um, to remind ourselves of and so powerful like even just you saying that I was I was like imagine if we all did this how different our experiences would be with each other and another three little words that I absolutely love and live by and have written on our glass window in our home is expectations ruin relationships. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Expectations ruin relationships. What else would you like me to say? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, really, honestly, it's all there. Mm. It's, It's exactly true right there. See, let, let, Melissa, let, let me back up just a minute here, because what I said a minute ago was pretty daring, people to walk into a room and think those things. And even what you just said now about expectations ruining relationships, we would only have an expectation at any time if we thought that there was something we needed or wanted or required or wish we could have to make life somehow better than it is right now. But such an idea is totally illusory. It's an illusion. We need nothing other than what's right here, right now in order to experience who we really are. But the problem is, most people have no idea what they're doing here. See, if you understand your soul's agenda, what is my purpose in being on the earth? 
That is, what am I up to here? Why did my holy, sacred self embrace and envelop this holy, sacred body and allow me to move through and walk through this experience for lo, these many years. What's the point of all this? When we understand that we came here to express and experience who we really are, that there's only one reason to be here, to really express and experience our true self, our highest nature, our absolute identity. And that's our only purpose and our only reason for being here. Once we understand that, we turn our whole life toward that objective. We focus our whole life in that direction. We find ourselves experiencing the kingdom of heaven within us. As all the great masters have said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. But there's something else that happens as well. The shifting of that energy changes our focus outwards from us to the world so dramatically that everything we thought we were stressing for and straining for and had to work so hard for begins to fall in on us automatically. I've experienced this in my life. You're talking to someone who's gone from penniless on the street to, how to put it gently, a person who's doing quite well in life and experiencing all the love and all the joy and all the wonder of this earthly experience. So I am mindful of what one great master once said. A really eloquent person who said many eloquent things, among which was this. So don't go around asking, what are we to eat? What are we to drink? Wherewithal will we clothe ourselves? Look at the lilies of the field and their glorious raiment. They don't work and neither do they spin. And if God so loved those little flowers of the field, will she not all the more love you? So, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. I could, of course, be wrong about all of this, but I don't think so. I don't think so either. (laughs) You know, this is just hitting me right in the heart space, and I've had many times throughout our conversation so far with just full body goosebumps and tears in my eyes and everything you're saying resonates so deeply because it's what I know to be true deep within and we just forget sometimes we have moments where we forget and I love when you forget just how you said before that you just have compassion for yourself and you allow yourself, you know, that's really given me permission to do that with myself when that comes up. Well, forgetfulness, of course, is a great gift. We have to understand that forgetfulness is not a mistake. It wasn't like an error that we, like we knew something got mixed into the recipe and ruined the pie. That, that, that is a, 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 an error in the mechanism of the universe. Forgetfulness is a great gift. Because forgetfulness allows us to recreate again, to experience once more, to produce again and again and again uh, the experience and, and the expression of who we really are. So, I, you know, thank you, God, for letting me forget so that I can remember once more. Oh, yes, that's right. I almost, yes, this is, I, I almost started taking this for granted. So, you know. It's, 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 it's a, forgetfulness is a wonderful thing. I said to my wife the other day, I've been married to her for 10 years, she's an extraordinary person, but she did something that just, just caught my eye. She just, she was, you know, just standing in front of the vanity, just putting her makeup on, but doing something very, 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 very feminine. And I looked at her and I, I just looked at her in the mirror and I said, you know what? I almost forgot how much I love you. Wow, just looking at you. She said, why, why, what did I do, what did I do? I said, sweetheart, you didn't have to do anything. You were just being innocently, purely, and gloriously yourself. And in that moment, I got very clear, looking at you in the mirror and seeing the reflection of you and feeling that reflection in my heart. Wow, I forgot how much I love you. But I remember now. That's so beautiful. That's really beautiful. Mm. I love 
another quote in the book, if you don't love what you've created, create again. And that just reminded me, you know, those times where we forget and then we remember maybe what we've created isn't what we would like, but we can create again. I love that. Yeah, that's the whole point of life, to recreate yourself anew in the next golden moment of now, in the next grandest version of the greatest vision ever you held about who you are. Thus to remember, that is to become a member once again of the body of God, to remember yourself as a part of the body of God. Yeah, that's the, that's, that's the glory and the wonder of life. And when we see all of life in that context, it changes everything. Absolutely. I would love to chat about another thing you mentioned in the book, and you, you talk about sex being sacred. Joy and sacredness do mix. They are, in fact, the same thing. Sex is an extraordinary expression of love, love of another, love of self, and love of life. Before I met my husband, I'd never experienced sex as a sacred practice, one with, you know, oneness and God. I'd never experienced that before. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes, well, you know, sex is an an acronym, synergistic energy exchange. All of us are making love with life all the time. We simply don't know what's going on. We simply aren't aware of it. When we become fully aware of it, we understand what's happening, not just in the act act of physical lovemaking, but in every moment of our life. We're making love to life, unless we're not, in which case, why, why aren't we? Why not? So when we understand what's happening in the human sexual experience, we understand that we are simply physicalizing the metaphysical reality that there's only one of us. There's nobody else here. I am you, and you are me. And we have become one in this moment and in this way. And we hold each other closer than two people could get. This is as close as we know how to be. And it isn't even for the physical sensation of it. That's, that's, just, the, <laughs> that's just the bonus. That's, that's, that's just the, the glorious after effect. What it is really for, the, 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 this, the sacred moment, is when you look into the eyes of your beloved, holding each other so close, closer than two people could possibly be in any other way. And you look into the eyes of your beloved and you say, oh my God, Oh my God, I'm you. You're me, there's nobody else here. There's only one of us. And that's when you've really had a sexual encounter that demonstrates the ultimate truth of life itself. There's only one of us here. And of course, that's the process by which new life is created. Of course, because life springs forth from life itself, expressed through the wonder and the glory of who we really are. People who understand that, people who live in that experience and that expression, are very, very fulfilled in their awareness of love itself. Mm. I I absolutely agree. I love that life springs from life itself. That's really beautiful. I just wrote that down because I thought it was so beautiful. Oh my goodness, this has just been so amazing. I would love to hear from you now. If there's something that you're currently working on within yourself, is there something that's, you know, that you're working on, that you'd like to improve within yourself at the moment, that's quite current? Everything. I'd like to improve everything within myself. What I'm working on is walking my talk, living what I'm saying, being what I'm envisioning, and expressing and experiencing that at the next highest level, and then the next, and then the next. So I'm working on Everything that we've just discussed, not one particular aspect of it, but the entirety of it. And every day I notice that I co-create with those around me and the world at large, continuing opportunities, allowing me to do that. 
And as long as I can remain in a place of gratitude for that, I can then move into the experience of it joyfully without cons- con- uh, without considering it to be burdensome or difficult or challenging uh, beyond anything that I want to face. So I'm, I'm working on everything, you know, ev- ev- everything uh, that, that I've talked to you about. Beautiful. What would you like to see in the future? Do you want to write more books? Is there, what do you kind of see? You know, I, I don't see anything anymore in the future specifically. I, I, I'm done. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 73 years old. I've written 33 books. I've traveled the world. Uh, I've been on, you know, international television programs. I've made a couple of movies. I've, honestly, I'm not bragging about. It. I'm just telling you that, that. So I don't have anything on my on my. Uh, uh, what do they call that? My list. What, what do they? You know that bucket list. list? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I don't have anything on my bucket list. You know that if I only had one more chance to do, except except maybe, as I said just a minute ago, on my bucket list is. Could I be even more loving? Could I be even more caring? Could I be even more understanding? Could I be even more generous, more compassionate, more forgiving, more patient, more of who I really am? That's on my bucket list. I want to. I want to be able to to experience, for instance, a week with my beloved other, my wonderful wife. Uh, I want to be able to experience a week with her and say at the end of that seven days. That's as good and as high as I can go. I can't get any more loving than I just was for that past seven days. So that's, you know, that's a challenge because you know stuff happens, things go on, and energies interfere. And and so I, I that's 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 on my bucket list. My bucket list is to walk through the world as the highest expression and the highest experience of who I really am. But nothing else. No, I don't. You know, I may write another book, and I may not. I may do another tour, or, you know, and I may not. I, I, I may give another seven-day intensive workshop, and I may not. It, it'll just, it'll, it'll. Whatever comes along will come along. Whatever happens will happen. I don't have any any agenda anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. <laughs> mm. Well, if you ever come to Australia, you will have to let me know. I would love to attend any of your workshops. They sound amazing. Well, we have a good time in them for sure. There's no question about that. Thank you for the invitation. (laughs) So let's pretend now that you have a magic wand and you could put one book in the school curriculum of every single high school around the world. Now, let's pretend that all of your books are already in the curriculum, all of them. So is there another book that you would love to see high school students all over the world get their hands on? Too many for me to pick out one um, because it forces me to somehow elevate one of the writings above the other's. So it's very, very difficult for me to do that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not tempted uh, to do that. Okay, no worries. Yeah, there's so many, so many beautiful texts out there. So many. So, um, but yours would definitely be great reading material for those high school students. That's for sure. I wish I read it back then. Um, but it's all perfect. I read it when I was meant to read it. Yes. You know, the, the, there is a science fiction book that, that I read when I was around oh, 25 or 29 years old. Uh, a fascinating uh, premise. The book was written by a man named Robert Heinlein. And uh, he wrote a book about uh, a science fiction book about a Martian uh, who came to Earth? It was a, it was a, a, an Earth boy uh, who, who whose parents died on a, on a on a uh, uh, an ex- expedition to Mars, and so he was raised by Martians, and uh, and then when he became of age, uh, the Martians felt it was only right that he be given the opportunity to return home. So in this science fiction book, the plot has it 
that he is sent back on a you know, super duper spaceship and he lands on Earth and he's now among his own people. Except he doesn't understand anything that's going on here. He doesn't understand conditional love. I love you if. He doesn't understand a society that would kill people deliberately in order to tell people that killing people deliberately is not okay and, and fail to see the contradiction. He doesn't understand the use of violence for any reason whatsoever. He doesn't understand commerce, business, industry, economics, how we could allow 653 children to die every hour on this planet of starvation. He doesn't understand how it's possible for 1.5 billion people to be without clear water. No access to clear water in the year 2017, 2017. He doesn't understand how 1.7 million can be without electricity, or 2.6 billion, I should say billion, not million, 2.6 billion, could be even without the basics of indoor sanitation. He doesn't understand how humanity could treat itself in this way and allow itself to do that and allow it to continue. So in the science fiction book, he you know proposes suggestions to people that he comes to know and and ideas, and his ideas are considered so revolutionary that the world starts paying attention to him, and he becomes ultimately a worldwide figure. But the the power structure of the world is so embedded, and they're so upset with what he's saying, because what he's saying would, would revolutionize the way life is lived on this planet, that they take him and they crucify him. And, and, and they kill him for bringing such extraordinary ideas to the planet. The book is called a Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. Extraordinary uh, science fiction metaphor uh, for life on the earth. That sounds amazing. I might get that for um, my 11 year old stepson. I think he would, and I'd like to read it as well, but that sounds great. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a powerful book, and it's a powerful use of science fiction and metaphor to uh, bring home a point that we would all be uh, well served to embrace. So, you know, I, I hope that we will do that. I hope we'll self-select, select ourselves to be among those who choose to model a new way of being human so that we could awaken the species. Mm. My next question for you uh, is about routines and morning routines in particular. I, I like hearing what people do to set themselves up for the day or if they have any non-negotiables, little um, routines or anything like that. Do you have anything like that that you do first thing in the morning? Well, I certainly don't have any non-negotiables. There's, there's no such thing as non-negotiable in my life. If I had non-negotiables, that would make me a very rigid person who couldn't flow with whatever the moment is bringing me. So, and whatever it, the world is co-creating and placing before me. So, I, I don't have any non-negotiables. I do have routines, but they're certainly negotiable. I, that is, I'm willing to step outside of my routine if something comes along that I assess to be to my benefit and bring me great joy. But my routines are very simple. I, I don't have breakfast. I get up in the morning, usually between 4.30 and 5.30 or 6 in the morning, very early, almost always before dawn, and I sit down and I start to write. I'm either writing a book or writing an answer to a person who's written me a question on uh, my internet site where people can ask me anything they ever, ever wanted to ask me. So there's a place called cwgconnect.com where people can write to me under the Ask Neil uh, column and ask me any question they want. I get dozens of questions a day and so I, I start to write usually i'm writing from 5 30 in the morning till around 10 30 or 11 perhaps noon and so the first half of my day is just sending into the world my understanding of the messages that have been given to me to share and the rest of the day i just spend being quiet with myself maybe i'll do some reading you see i don't have to go to work you know i'm 73 so my day is my own, and I can do what I wish and do what I please, and I've been blessed with sufficient income in my later years to have that freedom. So, you know, my wife and I might go out and do a little gardening or whatever we do and, and just have a quiet 
rest of the day. And we always make sure we spend our evenings together. We we uh, make certain that from six o'clock on, uh, the evening belongs to us. We may have friends over, we may have family over, but it's still our agenda, if you please, and our event. And then, you know, we go, I go get up the next morning at 4.30 or 5 o'clock and begin writing again. So I, that's how I wrote the book four in the Conversations with God series, which, uh, which I wrote in like five weeks, four and a half weeks. Wow, I can't wait to read that one. Sounds good. I'd love to hear now what are three things that you're most recently grateful for in your life? Huh. If you can limit it to three. Uh, my wife, my children, and my relationship with God. Beautiful. How many children do you have? I have nine. Nine children. Yes, I had triplets, which <sighs> kind of up, up to the ante a bit. <laughs> But I had, uh, I, I've got nine children, and uh, I'm I'm very grateful for them. And I'm, and there's a fourth thing that I'm grateful for. I'm grateful that my life has given me, particularly in these my later years, something that I can do, an activity that allows me to contribute, to continue to contribute, to add to uh, life, and then that I don't have to spend my later years simply taking from life. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and certainly nothing wrong with having earned a good retirement and, and, and reaping the benefits of it. And I'm not making that wrong, but I'm delighted that at my age, I'm still working uh, at something I love to do and that I'm traveling. I just came back from Barcelona and Lisbon, and I'm going off to uh, places all over the world here between now and December, between now and the end of the year. Um, so I'm grateful as well for my work. I'm very grateful that I, I get up in the morning with a sense of purpose and uh, uh, the well-being that comes from that. And I can, I can recall my father at, at my age sitting there in his easy chair watching soap operas on television because he had nothing better to do. He was forced into retirement at 65, and it was now nearly 10 years later, and he had nothing to do. You know, he had to try to find a hobby that could keep him active and keep him involved. And poor guy, he didn't have any hobbies. He, did, he didn't play golf. He didn't play tennis. He didn't collect stamps. He didn't collect antiques. He had no hobbies. So he was like staring at the wall trying to figure out, is that it? Is this what it was all about? You know, what, what, now what? So I'm grateful. My fourth thing that I'm grateful for is that I don't have to ask, now what? My life is scheduled every day with something that someone is asking from me, and I'm delighted that they are. Mm, that's so beautiful. I've got just a few more questions for you. Um, I'm curious to know, what's one of the most important things that we can do for our health? Pay attention to it. Mm, simple. And what's one of the most important things we can do for wealth in all areas of our life? Not require it. I, I say that because one doesn't require what one already has. So the, the, the great misunderstanding about wealth, and not just, as you said, not just material wealth or financial wealth, but wealth in all areas of our lives, the one thing that people misunderstand about that from my observation and i certainly misunderstood it for the first 50 years of my life is that we already have it we already have it so here i was yearning for it as i said earlier working for it stressing for it reaching for it and it was already there all the wealth all the love all the goodness all the joy uh, all the peace all the serenity all, all the wealth and and also even enough enough income enough money Obviously, I've always had enough money, or I wouldn't be. I'm, I'm still here. So there's the evidence. Obviously, I've always had enough, because here I am. 
So when I talk to people who in my audiences and they come to my workshops and my retreats and they say, wow, I've had such a tough life and you know all this and all that. I'm not making fun of it. I'm not making fun of it. I just want you to know. But what I say to them is, um, do you have a mirror? Does anybody have a compact with a mirror in it? Maybe a person next to them, maybe some lady. She says, yeah, I have a mirror in my handbag. I said, would you take it out and give it to this gentleman? She gives the compact to the gentleman. I said, is there a mirror in that compact? He said, yeah. I said, open it up and look, and what, what do you see? He says, uh, I see me. I see myself. I said, ah, so you're still here, are you? 56 years after you were born, you're still here. Clearly, you've had enough of whatever you needed to still be here. You've simply called it not enough. And by the judgments you've made about it, have you created your own misery? Stop it. You've had enough because here you are. Now, when you shift your whole idea about wealth in that way, not just material wealth, but all the things we think we don't have enough of, when you shift your whole idea around in the way I've described, you suddenly move into that place I talked about a half hour ago, gratitude. And the fastest way to realize that you have enough of anything, enough love, enough patience, enough compassion, enough understanding, enough income, enough of whatever you think you need to be happy, the fastest way to experience your own abundance in these areas is to be the source of it in the life of another. Whatever you wish you had more of in your life, find someone who has even less and be the source of it in their life. And in the giving of what you have to another, you will experience your own abundance, your own sufficiency with regard to that. And that change in your energetic signature will produce a shift in your external experience as well. I have found the fastest way to increase my income is to give money away. Why do you suppose that almost every great faith tradition in the world talks about tithing? Tithing is a process by which we are invited to give 10% or more of our monthly or yearly income to the source that inspires us or to what we want to support in the world by doing their good work for them through the support we give them. There's a reason why most of the world's great religions suggest that tithing is a powerful device. It's not because it helps good charities. It's not because it helps churches and and synagogues and temples and religions to do their work. It goes way beyond that. It's about if you are so strong and so sure in your conviction that you have enough to give away 10% of it every month to somebody else, that energetic signature produces the outcome. And the universe begins to hear, oh, I see. This guy thinks he has enough. And his word is our command. And the universe is always listening, isn't it? Boy, is it ever. (laughs) So the fastest way to get what you want is to give it away. Mm. I love that. Thanks for re-inspiring me, giving me a little kick up the tush with that one you're welcome what is one of the most important things that we can do for love more love in the world more self-love just love in general forget who you think that you are and what you think that you need and want i asked god what does it take to make life work why isn't my life working? I don't understand. What, what, what don't I know, the knowing of which would change everything? And she said, Neil, it's very simple. Listen, it's very simple. You think your life is about you. But your life has nothing to do with you. Your life is about everyone whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. Decide to live your life that way. Don't believe me. Just try it for 90 days. Watch what happens. So if you want to put more love into the world, be the source. Do not seek to be the recipient, but be the source of it. And you'll discover that you've turned yourself into a magician, or if you please, a sorcerer. Beautiful. 
Thank you for the reminder. The other, another beautiful reminder. Now I have uh, one more question for you. What can ten, ten and a half? <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to ask me my shoe size. <laughs> ten and a half. Go ahead. This has been so beautiful. It's been really, really beautiful, and I'm so grateful. But I would love to know how can I personally and everyone listening serve you today? By taking the messages that you and I have shared with each other and making them real in the living of your life. Deal. I'm on to it. That's for sure. Neil, this has been so beautiful. I'm so grateful and honored and so, so, so grateful to have you share what you've just shared with us. I want to go back and actually reread book one right now. You've re-inspired me. Um, and I'm so grateful for the work that you do in the world and for showing up for yourself. It's been really beautiful to hear from you today. Is there anything else you would like to share? Not really. Thank you very much. You said some very kind words and they are received with gratitude on this end. And I'm only grateful that my God has given me the opportunity um, to make the offering that I've made with the living of my life and the events that have occurred therein. So I'm very, very happy about that. And I appreciate the chance to share some of this with you and your audience. Thank you for asking me. Absolute pleasure. And please let us know if you come down to Australia ever. We would love to attend any of your events or retreats. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. I am so emotional right now. I'm trying to get my words together, but I feel like I'm a stumbling mess. Everything that he said was just resonating so deeply with what I know deep in my bones. I was just taken on a journey and I'm so grateful I got to have this conversation and I want to encourage you to listen a few times. Take on board what he has said and let it wash over you and maybe close your eyes and feel where he is speaking from, the space that he is speaking from. It's just pure love. Oh, I'm just so moved and I feel odd even asking this, but if this resonated with you and I can't imagine it wouldn't have, please subscribe to my podcast and leave me a five-star review in iTunes because that means that together we can help and inspire even more people by spreading this message. And don't forget to tell me on Twitter who you would like me to interview and make sure you tag me at Mel underscore Ambrosini and the person you want me to interview using the hashtag the Melissa Ambrosini show. And for everything that Neil and I mentioned in today's podcast, you can check out in the show notes and that is at melissaambrosini.com forward slash 32. And you can also check out all my other episodes there too. Thank you so much for being here, for wanting to be the best and shiniest version of yourself and for showing up today for you. You seriously rock. Now, if there is someone in your life that you can think of would really benefit from today's episode, please share it with them right now. Send them a link, send them a text, but get them to listen to this today. And until next time, gorgeous, don't forget that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.